The first speaker today is going to be Henrietta Saunders, who is a member of the Lake Michigan League Board, and um, she is going to speak about the history of water protection in the League. Hi, friends. I uh, am going to warn you, first of all, that I'm not a historian or a researcher. And uh, I hope you'll bear with me. Um, there is a ton of material, much more that I have left out than will be in here, and much more that I never even knew about than I even left out. So uh, I'll just get started. I'll ask you not to ask questions, except if it's really a clarification issue. And I'm around for the rest of the day. There's a lot that could merit some very interesting discussion in here. And I uh, think there's room for more, many more presentations in the future. Uh, as you can see, this is the first League of Women Voters board. The first League of Women Voters president, Maud, Park, uh, Maud P Wood Park, uh, said that the first League of Women Voters program was like a kettle of eels because all of the people who were so excited about having the vote and being engaged citizens had an awful lot of things they wanted to work on. I think that uh, one theme you will discover is that uh, some of that hasn't changed over time. And um, what they did with all of the many issues they had was they organized a series of what they called planks. You can see there. Uh, and um, it was uh, their authority and the political action that was coming at that time was really based in the idea of women as caretakers that perceived role as us expanded caretakers of the home. So the idea of water protection wasn't a phrase that would have, uh, would have um, resonated with them very much. But the first issue right up there is child welfare. And in terms of child welfare and public health, there's water, especially at the early 1920s. Sanitation, sewage, fresh water for children and, and anybody, that was a big part of it. Uh, as I went through uh, the history, here's a little framework that I kind of um, came up with. Let's see if I can make this work. Um, and uh, the colors don't come up very well, and it's super simple, but public health has been a consistent theme all the way through since the very beginning. Uh, good government and administration, that is worth a, a special moment. The progressive era was the rise of professional uh, the management as a profession, as many of you probably know, administration and the idea of being organized and having processes to improve outcomes was a lot of the cultural uh, public thinking at those days. And that was really built into our DNA. Uh, also in 1922 was the Teapot Dome scandal, which was Warren Harding. So they were really interested in civil service and in promoting uh, honesty, transparency, and so forth in government, which we are still now. And in the bottom, the know your community is a theme that comes all the way through our history too. In the very early days, 1920s, the League was uh, running citizenship schools, doing surveys for people to help, help them learn about their own communities. And for decades, I believe, the idea of know your community, there was a requirement that local leagues do a, a, a study or a survey of their community before they got their charter. I happen to have the one from Waukegan, Illinois, that was from uh, 1960s. It's a second edition. There's a chapter on waterworks in here. And um, you can find these at local libraries for communities all over the country. Um, so that's um, a very high uh, conceptual idea. And now here's an ugly slide. I actually, um, in typical league fashion, learned so much, uh, goes past 1970, that I learned a new skill of how to make a scroll bar inside a presentation, and I can't make it work. <laughs> but I made backup slides that are, that are not uh, fancy. So on the left, you will see just some basic, only water kinds of things that were really important that happened. And the first thing, the Tennessee Valley Authority, that was something we worked on as part of the government, good government, and a big project, obviously. Uh, Federal Water Pollution Control Act. The things on the right are things that I could find evidence that we had worked on. And I did a cursory you know, examination of the web, basically, in a couple of documents. So I didn't see directly that we worked on that. That was the first law that gave a federal mechanism for, con for addressing problems uh, that had crossed state boundaries with water. So it was really important. And it helped focus attention, as Judy Beck would tell us on you know, who to talk to when there's a problem, right? So that Federal Water Pollution Control Act, I believe we must have been active because if you look over on the right, you can see the League did a three-year water resources study. This is national in 1956 through 58. 
They had a position on what the federal role in water issues should be. They started a series of activities, which I'll talk about in a minute, called Know Your River Basin. And um, they continued to work on water in many, uh, for many years. In 1965, that Water Quality Act, we have the pen when President Johnson signed that in our office in Washington. We were there at the table. I don't know the exact role, but um, that's kind of the message that I want to give overall with this busy slide is that especially in those uh, 50s and 60s, we were at the table, we were ahead of the game, we were doing things before the US EPA wa and was um, created by executive order by Richard Nixon. We were working on groundwater. Uh, you can see this one, 1960s. Lee gets a seat on Water Information Council. I say act, ask Judy Beck, because that seat still continues and Judy Beck uh, uh, occupies it. It's now a, f a federal, um, FACA, which I remember, but Federal Advisory Committee. And you know, that's, that's in the, uh, the Congressional Register and so forth. Um, I don't have my scroll bar, so I have to do this. Whoa. But anyway, we keep going and going. You can see that uh, there's drinking water, 1987. Some of these things that are underlined, we had a big publications business. Many of you will remember this, some won't. It kind of dwindled down into nothingness and was taken off the books in 2016. But we were publishing books and distributing them as a way to talk about the issues and what we found in our studies and how people should be active. Uh, so we had some nice ways of sharing. Obviously, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, it became more about energy, conservation. We started to use the words environment and ecology across the country. And the League incorporated water. We still did some watershed work, and we still did water work, but we started to do things that were more oriented towards um, broader uh, interpretations of water, although we had done some air stuff before. In 2006, the Climate Change Task Force was created. It still exists. It is a self-funded group of volunteers who are doing great work with the blessing of the National League. Um, so my main message for having all of that stuff that I just went through so quickly is that we were at the table. These are some signing pens, two of these. One, is this, one in the middle is TV, the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, this one at the bottom is the one I just mentioned from Johnson, the Water Quality Act. And the one at the top was the first piece of legislation from Warren Harding when he gave Windeman independent citizenship. So if you married a foreigner, you wouldn't lose your US citizenship. That was important to the league. Uh, and on the right, you can see this is a woman actually from, I think she's from LaGrange, Illinois. And she was appointed to the President's Water Pollution Control Advisory Board. I looked up some of their uh, minutes and meetings and of course, she was only the, wo the only woman on the board, but she was very active there. Uh, so the publications, here's, uh, I happen to have a copy of this book. It's really interesting. I got it on Amazon. And this book, which was published in 1966 by the League of Women Voters Education Fund, talks about activities in big watersheds that the League was involved in. There were a lot of ILOs, and I'm going to refer to ILO not as the officially sanctioned, what we call it now, and the rigmarole that the Upper Mississippi River region had to do to get chartered uh, re in over the course of many years recently, but just organizations. Uh, and they may not have had a vote at convention as a chartered R ILO does now, but these were uh, sometimes called council, sometimes called committee. And uh, the water fight talks about um, fights or discussions or especially planning boards and commissions that League was involved in across the country as you can see up there, it says supply, pollution, floods, and planning. That's pretty good, and it covers uh, very much of what we still work on now, right? And uh, for example, I happen to know, stemming back from this era in Texas, there were uh, League of Women Voters uh, always had a spot on all the Texas water boards. These were the kinds of things that were happening at the local and regional level, and I know very little about it. We, had, we didn't have a mechanism to gather a lot of this information except through the publications. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the Know Your River Basin initiative, which was in 1958 and 59, and how it spawned some of these larger ILOs and groups that um, did some terrific work. Um, this was something I, I read, oh, there's a Know Your Water Basin initiative, right? And then there was also Know Your River Basin, I should say. And there were kits on how to do your own Know Your River Basin study. So this is from 1959. Some wonderful librarian in Seattle digitized it. 
which I'm grateful for. And you can see it was typed. It is dense. This is just the first page of the index. I think the whole thing is about 40 pages. And you know, then they probably mimeographed it and sent it around, right? And uh, they really knew what the heck was going on in the Columbia River Basin. Well, when I look at this, I'm wondering, OK, so what about now? You know, is this interesting and wonderful but sad because it's not happening? So I googled Columbia River Basin and LWV. This is the current LWV Idaho website. They have a call to action about the Columbia River Treaty. They reference in there their long history of uh, being involved with the Columbia River Basin. And they actually have a cool tool. You could click on that, print a letter that you can sign and mail. So we might try to do that. I thought that was pretty neat. Um, and then I uh, found another one. These are the only two original studies that I could find uh, scanning the internet. This is the story of the Delaware River Basin. It's called Man and the River with a 1959 copyright. And um, keep in mind, 1959, a bunch of people worked on this. I found a lot of information about uh, a woman in New Jersey through an obituary. There are a couple of obituaries online that were just, I wish I could stand here and read the whole things to you. They're so moving. But this was a woman named Peggy Haskins in New Jersey, who I don't know if she was involved in the study. I don't know if she when she joined the league, but she was in the Delaware Bas River Basin Interleague Council when the Army Corps of Engineers came up with the idea of building a big, huge dam. And uh, as you may know uh, now, the Delaware River is one of the last unimpeded, beautiful, big waterways in the contiguous 48 states. But that was under threat. The League of Women Voters Delaware River Basin Interleague Council went into action, studied this proposal from the Army Corps of Engineers, discovered and, and um, wrote up that they thought it would do more harm than good, organized opposition, and it was never built. And Peg Haskins stayed involved for 30 years. She got on the New Jersey Water Authority Board, which is the state board for water supply for the whole state. In her obituary, one of her colleagues said, well, we never would have built the successful Manasquan Reservoir without her, and that's one of the places that supplies water now. And she also spent, uh, was known for crisscrossing the state with a watershed model that showed how groundwater can be polluted by salt water and, uh, po and uh, pol industrial pollutants if it's not uh, cared for. So that, that uh, with our Lake Michigan project on the watershed models really caught my heart. Uh, the last thing I'll say about uh, Peg Haskins is that uh, one of her colleagues also said that Peg was a formidable adversar ad adversary because she w if you disagreed with her, she would work hard to get on your committee and convince you of her point of view. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Uh, so again, I looked up to see what's going on. Was this lost work? I mean, we certainly not lost in, in the fact that they, you have to keep reinventing and resaving these places. So they did a fabulous thing for us all now in the future. But what's the story with the lake? And I did a simple Google of the Delaware River Basin and LWV and found a testimony from a local league from New Jersey that was uh, cautioning the Delaware, Delaware River Basin Commission in 2011 to go cautiously with fracking regulations because they want to protect the waterfront. So this is, this is uh, really something to be very proud of. Um, the last one I will go through, oh, I got to really speed it up, huh? The, uh, this is a defunct, it was a sister um, organization of the Lake Michigan League, just, just petered out a couple of years ago. Their website is still up and that shows a number of leagues. Maybe some of you are from those leagues, we could get it started again. But this um, uh, committee was started by a woman named Edith Chase. Uh, who was from the, uh, one of the founding members of the Kent, Ohio League, and she was the president of the Kent, Ohio League. And I don't know if she was uh, originally part of this. She was certainly aware of the Know Your River Basin studies, but she, was, uh, helped, she, she, helped, she did help start this, actually. I don't know if she was part of a river basin study, but after starting the Lake Erie Basin Committee, she went on with some other people to start the uh, Kent Environmental Council, which covers the Lake Erie Basin and the Cuyahoga River. This was two years before the Cuyahoga River burned. Uh, the Lake Erie Basin Committee was a member of that council. Uh, Edith Chase has now uh, been dead for quite a while. And look what's going on. This is June 2018. Uh, the League of Ohio, even though the committee's gone, they co-sponsor with this council a wonderful symposium every year so in her honor. 
Uh, so there's a lot to be proud of and a lot of ways that we can see that our members became active, engaged citizens just as our foremothers wanted and really had a huge impact. I have a lot of material about the Lake Michigan League, which I will skip uh, right now, but the 1970s and 80s, it's harder to find, and 90s even for me on the internet of things that happened. I think a lot of things were happening at the local level. If you Google water in the league, you come up with a zillion things all over the country. But um, uh, many of these, were the publications department was still doing some work, but these, it was hard to disseminate information during those years. And uh, so if we have things in boxes like uh, we do in the Lake Michigan League, that's how we know how much was going on. Look at the variety. Pesticides were a huge issue, shoreline erosion. In 1970s, the um, League of Women Voters of Illinois had a coastal management zone grant for citizen engagement. They did a ton of meetings. It was a previous coastal management zone program and the meetings were called uh, The Future of Lake Michigan is in Your Hands. Um, so, and then there was a group in the south suburbs uh, called the DRIPS, who were very active, and they were league members. And one of them, their leader was uh, Dr. Mary Woodland. There is a 361 million gallon reservoir that's part of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of the whole Chicago region, named for her, and that was done in 1988. So. Uh, you know, again, uh, we're still here, and that's good, and it would be fun to have a timeline of all of these things. Now, here's uh, I'm coming to the end. This is currently what's on the web. It's not on this new league management site, but because, again, it's a series of volunteers who are blessed by the National League, but a little bit outside. Uh, I've been on this committee. It started at the convention in 2010 as a way to try to share what we're doing. And, of course, this is oriented towards studies. There are fewer studies now, but... You can see um, down the side they have an index. Uh, there are things, other things on other environmental issues and on uh, various aspects that are tangential. These are the direct water studies that were collected, have been collected, and it's not a systematic thing. So I wondered again, what is missing? And I swear to you, I just off the top of my head said Utah. I don't know anything about Utah. Let's see what they got going. And look at what came up. This is 2015, multi-state, a couple of big studies. There is still great work going on, and uh, we don't have a very good way to capture it and share. So I would just um, raise the question of, uh, you know, how do we think about continuing this work? Is it an investment that we want to make, and at what levels? I think the local leagues have already answered that they are often interested in water issues. Um, but how do we think about that as an organization at man many levels? And are we willing to keep it going? And I hope the answer is yes. Mm -hmm.